My name is Lowell Kessel. I'm uh, presenting on behalf of Beacon Environmental Laboratory uh, based in uh, Maryland the, in the U.S. Uh, the topic here is um, an evaluation of soil gas sampling methods with respect to vapor intrusion model assumptions and uh, specifically referencing the uh, Johnson and Endiger model while at the same time um, the petroleum vapor intrusion model uses a lot of the same assumptions and model uh, backgrounds, but I won't be getting into PVI much. Um, so the question here is, while, while you're listening to the presentation, is to ask yourself uh, whether steady state versus vacuum extraction soil gas sampling um, which of these two is going to be a better approach for obtaining the data that you need for vapor intrusion models and steady state being passive sampling versus uh, vacuum extracted being active sampling. So let's get started. So Beacon is a specialized laboratory focused on providing uh, highly accurate air and soil vapor data. Uh, the lab is accredited in accordance with ISO 17025, um, has DOD uh, ELAP accreditation as well as National uh, Environmental Laboratory accreditation across the U.S. Um, and they're accredited for uh, methods EPA uh, 8260, uh, TO17, TO15, and 325. All of them are passive sampling or adsorbent sampler uh, analysis methods. Um, Beacon's quality system ensures consistent and reliable results and we have demonstrated that with years of service uh, with many of our clients. Um, Harry O'Neill, uh, the leader of Beacon Environmental, uh, was also the lead author in the development of the ASTM standard uh, passive soil gas sampling in, in the Beto zone, which came out a handful of years ago. Beacon Environmental has been providing analytical services for soil gas and air sampling uh, using sorbent samplers for over 21 years. Um, we are the testing at industrial, commercial, residential sites uh, in more than 25 countries and on all seven continents, including Antarctica, um, which occurred just recently uh, in recent years. So temporal variability and spatial variability are the major challenges with regards to site investigations um, and soil gas sampling. And this is going to be the primary focus of the rest of the, the talk is what is temporal variability? Um, what are its influences, uh, meteorological, barometric pumping, or even the sampling method? Um, groundwater table fluctuations, and then spatial variability, uh, heterogeneity in Vado zone soil properties, which is very significant in silty and clay or organic rich soils. Um, there's hydrogeological influences, um, such as, you know, if you have a perch water table, shallow water, groundwater uh, a table, if there's a lot of rain or irrigation, uh, high moisture conditions, that will definitely influence it and I'll show you the, we'll get into the math behind that. Uh, contaminant distribution, are you sampling near source or are you, uh, you know, investigating a plume and a vapor uh, diffusion and migration from a groundwater plume into um, shallow soil gas or a building? And then the ground cover, is it concrete, asphalt, dirt or grass and what have you? So when is the right time to sample? And that's a good question that has no, no perfect answer if you're thinking of picking a single day for sampling. So let's look at some seasonal temporal variability differences. This is showing uh, a study where the winter season has a lot more variability in indoor air concentration compared to the spring. And that's mostly uh, has been attributed to the HVAC system uh, changes uh, in pressure within the building. Here's um, daily and or hourly changes 
uh, for indoor air concentrations um, in a women's restroom and um, and in in this case it may be due to uh, barometric pressure changes uh, in combination with maybe a fan that's operating in in the restroom um, or or other HVAC operations uh, but overall vapor concentrations uh, can vary in both the subsurface and indoor air environments due to a number of different variables including barometric pumping um, soil moisture dynamics building ventilation wind shear and other factors as Hosangadi uh, noted there in this quote below one of the things I do want to highlight here is that the barometric pressure change that we're looking at here is four inches of water. That's approximately a thousand pascals according to the scale here. So I want you to keep keep note of that four inches of water pressure. And in this case, we're looking at temporal variability of soil gas um, that is daily and even hourly. Um, that's measured uh, from a gas clam uh, device in the field. And in this case, we're looking at barometric pressure changes of about 16 inches of water. Now we're looking at daily to weekly sub slab soil gas temporal variability uh, changes. And the scale is in uh, log scale, so it's really hard to see uh, the, the finer details. But there is variability. You can see the lines are squiggly. And since we're talking about order of magnitude, scale um, those are pretty significant when we're when we're looking at vapor intrusion uh, risk models any change or difference is significant and so the question is when is the right time to sample or how is the best way to sample considering that there's temporal variability both indoor in soil gas and sub slab so that's that's the background as to why this technical evaluation is uh, important to have a discussion about. So when we look at the Johnson and Enger model, which is a one dimensional model that is governed by steady state diffusion through the unsaturated zone and steady state advection and diffusion through the building slab. And what's that what that means is that this is a model that will uh, help practitioners determine what the indoor air concentrations are predicted to be based on concentrations in soil gas uh, in the Vado zone uh, just beneath the slab, as well as concentrations in groundwater diffusing and moving through the Vado zone and through uh, a slab in the building. And when we look at when we look at what are the dominant factors or processes occurring, um, near slab or shallow soil gas, uh, definitely within three feet and, um, and up to about five feet, depending on soil type and, um, and the structure or design of the footings of the building, there will be a significant component of advection. Below that, and depending on how deep the water table may be, um, steady pseudo steady state diffusion is occurring and advection has less of an effect. If you have shallow groundwater, then shallow groundwater pushes, uh, reduces the distance between the slab and the groundwater table and pushes you closer to uh, an area or a, a, a condition where advection becomes a very significant component as well as diffusion. Whereas below, at further depths, uh, diffusion is dominating uh, the transport processes. So let's look at diffusion. Diffusion, when we're talking about surface diffusion of VOCs coming off of organic matter or clay materials in the soil, it's coming, it's diffusing out and going into the pore space of the soil. And this is in a steady state equilibrium. Some of it is absorbing, some of it's disorbing, it's constantly changing um, based on advective flux or advective changes, which is flux and uh, pressure and temperature and 
um, it, and also is co contaminant specific. Each compound will be achieving its own equilibrium in space and time within this pore space. And advection is driving it out of a particular point in space or in the subsurface and moving it, generally speaking, towards the surface um, and outside or into a building. So diffusion is dominated by a couple of different conditions. One is moisture, how much moisture is there. And like I said, each compound is unique. So the Henry's constant and the adsorption coefficient for the that specific compound will, will factor into what that equilibrium concentration may be. Soil properties are also really key. Uh, how much organic content or clay is there is really significant. And as we all know, most or many sites have a lot of silt and clay and low permeability applications. So advection is the other component, as I mentioned, and as we get closer to um, shallow soil gas, that's, that's very significant. And that is controlled by soil structure, how much porosity, uh, the fractures, soil type, and soil pore tortuosity is what is the shape of the pores um, in the soil. And um, that is more significant. Tortuosity may become more significant when you have siltier or clayier soils because it's irregular and non-homogeneous. Whereas if you have a clean sand, the porosity is a lot more uniform. So what is driving the advection? And that's principally pressure or vacuum and flow. So if you have a changing water table and you have shallow groundwater, you're basically filling up any void space uh, with water and that's driving or pushing uh, any uh, vapor and, and uh, um, pore space um, air uh, upwards and out of the Vado zone. Or if you're inducing a vacuum with some pump or equipment. Um, as well as barometric pressure naturally is occurring. As we saw, barometric pressure changes can be anywhere uh, commonly between 4 and 16 inches of water. So let's look at a soil gas model that incorporates all components of, of what's happening in the Vado zone. And here you see that in the dusty gas model that a pressure gradient um, is applied to, to the equation in order to um, result at an equilibrium concentration that's also balanced with diffusion. So you have advection and diffusion that need to uh, balance out and, and that's what results in some equilibrium concentration based on the input parameters. The dusty gas model inc incorporates both diffusive and advective, advective flux, as you can see in the equation. And with regards to diffusion, you have molecular diffusion. Um, and um, as I mentioned, in, with respect to the Millington quirk, um, this incorporates how much water moisture is going to be affecting the results of the diffusion. But then you also have Newton diffusion, which is subtracted from molecular diffusion. And that occurs when the gas mean free path is greater than the pore radius, which becomes significant when you have silty clay and organic materials. So like I said, tortuosity or the, the shape of the pore space is in fact significant because you have adsorption and desorption occurring in microscopic space uh, within that pore space. And, and so when you see, when you think about what is causing advective change, it's change in pressure and, and a pressure gradient. So what is the pressure gradient in steady state? And then is there a change in pressure resulting or causing an advective flux or change in that concentration as well? And based on those changes, diffusive changes will occur. So when we look at um, 
specifically concentrations from groundwater moving to uh, sub-slab condition, uh, vapor concentration, we have to incorporate um, what the diffusive diffusion coefficient is across the capillary fringe. And this is why understanding the depth of groundwater is so significant and really understanding what the soil matrix types or different types of strata that are that exist beneath the slab between the slab and the groundwater table and in this space high moisture conditions do prevail it is very humid and the the equation here that we're looking at for um, the diffusion uh, coefficient we're looking at diffusion of air divided by total porosity and diffusion uh, the diffusion um, coefficient for that compound in water divided by porosity so clearly the soil type is significant in the um, and what the uh, effective concentration is going to be as well as water moisture and water moisture does have uh, a pretty significant factor there in terms of what that concentration is going to be um, uh, diffusing out of the water table and so how do we know that this is true in practice well uh, here's a study that's showing wet season sampling so comparison of uh, and this is a chart showing a comparison of flow uh, from sampling, uh, the flow rate that you're uh, sampling with. Uh, and this is an active soil gas sampling event um, divided by specific capacity. And what is shown here are sampling at different depths. We have shallow sampling at six feet. Uh, what they refer to as intermediate sampling at 9 feet and deep sampling at 12 feet. And you can see that the 12 feet, where, whether we're sampling during a wet or a dry season, is pretty linear. It doesn't really change too much. That implies that the water that may be coming from the rain um, and uh, increasing moisture conditions in the soil isn't getting that far deep. Um, in the intermediate zone, there is some variability, but pretty limited. Um, but you see the shallow, the shallow soil gas is very significantly skewed during the wet season. The flow rate is significantly reduced, um, and that results in a smaller value. And there you go, you get a skewed, you get a skewed result. And so what this, what this indicates is that there are diffusion limitations that are more pronounced when there's high moisture conditions which results in you have increased vacuum decreased flow and you're changing the advective flux or the pressure change that you're uh, causing or inducing with your vacuum extraction sampling approach is resulting in an effective change in what the steady state concentration is going to be once you get the analytical results back. So let's look at uh, what is active soil gas sampling. Um, it's basically extracting a soil vapor sample from a temporary or permanent probe that's uh, installed in the subsurface. Um, this may be a vapor pin, it may be a, a traditional uh, soil gas well that is uh, set at four or five feet or, or maybe deeper. Whatever it happens to be, you're installing, um, uh, you're creating a surface seal and extending a tube or a pathway um, to the subsurface such that you can attach a pump or some kind of vacuum canister to extract under vacuum uh, a vapor sample from the subsurface at whatever depth that may be. Now it's important. There's a lot of there's a lot of conditions as to what is an appropriately designed uh, active soil gas sampling well because you are inducing a vacuum and you don't want to have leakage from the surface going into the subsurface 
uh, resulting in dilution or a biased result um, from the from a vacuum extraction extracted sample. All right, and in practice, when you see when you look at what's all required, there's a lot of instruments, there's a lot of controls. You have to have a lot of gauges to verify things aren't aren't uh, going awry. Um, you have a shroud that you have to have a tracer gas in order to verify that the leakage from the sub surface to the subsurface isn't occurring through the seal. Um, and, and anyways, there's a, there's a lot to it. And as a result, there is agency guidance that, that is very specific about what is an appropriate design or uh, control for, for uh, shrouds. Um, how to install the probes um, and, and allowing equilibrium conditions to establish after a probe is installed, which, is, which can be two hours to weeks, depending on the method or the design and the soil type. If you have very clay soils, you should wait a lot longer than two, two hours. Um, if it's sandy soils, uh, two hours is more than enough time, I'm sure. Um, you have to do shut-in tests, leak tests, purge volumes uh, tests uh, in order to evaluate it. And of course, doing all these pump tests uh, is very uh, significant because you're 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 causing extreme flow, high pressure changes that result in high advective flux, and definitely moving away from what steady-state conditions is. So. In sandy soils, uh, and generally, in speak, uh, in general, um, you don't want to have a flow rate that is is too high, um, and a flow rate of 100 to 200 mils per minute um, is is good. A max vacuum of 100 inches of water is is present. Now, remember, we talked about uh, barometric pressure changes can be anywhere between four and 16 inches of water. So that's fine in terms of a max vacuum. So we're definitely below that. So sampling low permeability soils, that's a problem. So you, it, if, if there is insufficient flow, um, you need to repeat it at another day and time. Um, and there is still a max vacuum of one inch of water. And, and if it doesn't work, if you can't achieve uh, sampling within those conditions, then you have to install a new well, so maybe with a larger sand pack and a smaller diameter. Um, and if that doesn't work, then, you know, the agencies say do passive sampling because they know that that'll still achieve the result in terms of characterizing what the VOCs that are present uh, are for the site investigation. So in the appendix of the California DTSC guidance, um, it states that the occurrence of steady state conditions is defined as less than 130 pascals uh, at pressure change within 30 minutes. That's, that's only a half an inch of water. So steady state is the con presumptive condition or assumption of model conditions in a vapor intrusion model, according to Johnson Ettinger or even PVI. Steady state conditions. And, and here it's it's pretty clear the steady state conditions is is less, you know, a half an inch of water or less within 30 minutes and an active soil gas sampling. Um, it's clearly not that I mean, unless you have a very clean sand, as you can see in this table here, relatively speak, relatively clean sand might get you a half an inch of water, but any silt, you're going to start to increase vacuum and flow rates going to decrease and um, it's pretty pretty high vacuum so the conclusion is that active soil gas sampling is nowhere near steady state condition and and is not a method done in accordance with the vapor intrusion modeling assumptions so to highlight why or how this is manifested in the field here's a study that was just done and published this year earlier this year where they looked at sub-slab sampling to see what the differences were uh, among different uh, soil gas probes for active soil gas sampling. 
And you can see here that the conventional soil gas probe uh, results in a very uh, consistent result, depending on where you're sampling for repeat samples. And then you have uh, the California version, which is in the blue, and that's a lot more sporadic. It's not very consistent um, with repeat sampling or duplicate sampling conducted in the same probes over time. Um, it's, it's, uh, that's a concern. And then in the middle, you have uh, the vapor pin. Now, of course, there's, a, there's quite a bit difference in terms of results that you're seeing. There's a disparity here. Um, and then vapor pin is kind of consist, not, it's kind of in the middle. It's not very, not as consistent as conventional points, but more consistent than the California uh, specified probes. And so how is this possible if we're talking about samples collected in the exact same location uh, all adjacent to each other. All of these probes were installed adjacent to each other within meters, like literally within a few meters. And there is consistent differences in active soil gas sampling probe types. The reason is that each is designed with a different diameter um, they're installed at different depths. Those, the diameter is going to affect the flow. The flow affects the vacuum. The depth will, influ will be influenced by the soil that it's, it's placed in, or, uh, and, and that will be dictated or um, influenced by soil type and moisture condition. So if you're collecting a sample that's just in soil gas uh, that's in the soil where there's moisture, you will get a different result than what you might see if you were sampling literally within the slab. If it was, you know, you're collecting a sample that's uh, like from a vapor pin and it's right in the slab, um, you're getting a different result because there will be less water moisture in that particular location compared to deeper down into the soil. And so what result are you getting and how is this useful or valuable for your vapor intrusion model? And these are the these are the questions you should be asking. So let's talk about passive soil gas sampling. It utilizes a tube um, and or and and it could be a uh, uh, a tube like a the like steel tube where it goes all the way through um, with a cap on one end, or it could be like the beacon passive sampler, which is a vial that has a single opening. And that is uh, placed in a hole. And this is showing, you know, drilling through the, through the surface cap. In this case, it's asphalt. Um, it's placed down the hole upside down because vapors are moving from the subsurface in, in into the sampler, right? Uh, this aluminum sleeve is illustrated here in, in this diagram, and that's placed in the subsurface, and the sampler is placed within the, the sleeve. You don't need to have the sleeve. You could do it open hole, but generally speaking, we recommend uh, putting it into a pipe to ensure that there's no soil collapse and losing the sampler down hole. And it's sealed at the surface with concrete. It is possible to create a, a reusable um, vapor well uh, port um, and then you put a, a locking seal cap uh, locking well cap on top that you can re, you know resample over time so that is a possibility and I can I can share some design diagrams uh, proposed design diagrams that that satisfy agency requirements um, if that's desirable but basically these this is placed down hole and allowed to sit for a period of days um, in order to collect a sample. So how does it actually work? Well, the VOCs that are outside of the surface and, and in the subsurface, they would be VOCs that are in steady state condition at depth here. And as, as uh, over time, VOCs are constantly moving into the tube in order to establish an equilibrium concentration within this vapor probe. <coughs> Excuse me. As, this, as the VOCs move through the sampler, 
and to the adsorbent or through the sampler mouth and into the adsorbent, as it touches the sorbent, it is adsorbed completely. And so therefore, there is a zero concentration of VOCs at the surface of the adsorbent because it is a very strong adsorbent and will not let go of the VOC once it's, once it's adsorbed in. And this, the flow, the rate of movement of the VOCs into the sampler and towards adsorbent is linear. And that's in accordance with Fick's first law. So you have change in concentration over change in time uh, based on uh, the uptake rate or diffusion rate. And so in order for uh, passive samplers to work, uh, the VOCs must be retained on the sorbent for the full duration of the sampling period with zero back diffusion. Um, the thermal desorption method that Beacon uses completely desorbs the VOCs from the adsorbent, and there is no irreversible absorption there. And then we thermally recondition each sampler at 20 degrees Celsius higher than the testing um, and or the desorption temperature that's done during the time of analysis. And that is before each deployment. So that ensures that there's no VOC carryover issues, which is a common concern with canisters. And the way the concentration is calculated is the mass that's collected on the adsorbent over, time, over the time period, which is time here, divided by the uptake rate. And that gives you the concentration. So passive samplers can be applied um, in a lot of different applications. They can be applied in, in sole gas applications, as we've been talking about, and sub-slab or deeper. Um, they're commonly being deployed in sewer lines. Uh, they're being deployed inside buildings, on the basements, inside the restrooms or the living space, and even in um, traps. Uh, in utility lines, or even in the plumbing vents in this, uh, to determine how much uh, VOCs is within the lines of the building, because all buildings have uh, vents um, for the plumbing, um, which would be a good indicator and pretty easy to sample in that, in that condition. And so when we compare what, you know, we, we've compared some of the fundamental assumptions about active versus passive. Um, there's a, definitely a difference between a short duration and a long duration sample. Um, but in practical, in practicality, um, the practicality of sampling with big SUMA canisters is a lot more cumbersome than a passive sampler because they can be hung in any location. They're not intrusive into people's homes. Um, they're not as obvious if you're doing outdoor or ambient sampling to compare with the indoor air concentration. Uh, they're less likely to be tampered with, stolen, or, or what have you. They are small, so you don't want it. You want to make sure you remember where you put them so you don't lose them, right? But they're a lot easier to use. And as I mentioned, they're thermally reconditioned to ensure that uh, carryover is uh, of VOCs from one project to the other doesn't occur, as was documented in this study by Tom McHugh and, uh, a few years ago, where they looked at uh, uh, more than 1,400 samples from 400 sites uh, over a time frame of, of um, 13 years and a lot of data and they found that when you looked at groundwater samples um, the relative percent difference between duplicates is is reasonable it's within the industry standard you know zero to thirty percent relative percent difference um, was achieved in at least 85 percent of the samples that were done and and in some cases you have some outliers that may be cross-contamination or or other things we don't know um, but when you look at SUMA canisters, they found that only just half of the samples were within 30% relative percent difference. And many of the samples, almost half, had anywhere between uh, 30 to 100% or over 300%. So you could have a result with a duplicate or have a result 
without a duplicate and you could be 300% off because you don't know about the QA, QC uh, controls and viability of that sample. And it's not cost effective to do a duplicate on every sample to check that. And you're typically doing five to 10% dupes uh, in order to have an, a sense of, of the quality. But that's, that's a real concern, which is not a concern with adsorbent samplers because of the, the process um, and methods that we use, um, specifically thermal absorption and, and, uh, and uh, reheating uh, prior to deployment to ensure that everything's, everything's clean. So here's an example, uh, a study where we wanted to look at the difference between 24 hour samples and longer duration sampling periods. And um, the passive samplers, the beacon passive samplers you see in the picture here, were, were done in triplicate so that we can look at uh, duplicate variability. And the 24 hour samples were collected at a flow rate of 10 mils per minute with a total volume of 14.4 liters. And you can see the, in, the equipment here where it was changing uh, a sampler. Every 24 hour, a new sampler would be deployed uh, or employed for uh, sample collection. And so let's look at 23 days. So in this 23 day period, you had a 24 hour average concentration um, that was just over one PPBV. And then here's on the next day was closer to three and dropped to two and it goes up and down uh, across this period. And then it then it spikes and there's a, a, a an episodically high period of concentrations that's being collected. Um, now, if you were to collect a 24 hour sample one day on your site investigation uh, for vapor intrusion study, if you happen to collect the sample on this day, you would get a very high bias, low concentration. Or if you collect it on this day, you would be very concerned, relatively speaking, compared to what the average concentration is over the time period. And it's important to collect a time weighted average concentration because that is a better approximation of the exposure period for somebody living or working in that environment. And so a longer duration sampling period is and has been documented by EPA um, and numerous agencies to be a, a, a more representative uh, sample and data for vapor intrusion analysis, risk analysis. And so when we look at the, the beacon samplers in triplicate, the average concentration was 3.43, whereas the average concentration of the um, 24 hour samples was 3.3. And so that's only an RPD difference of 4%. So you can collect one sample or even duplicate samples of passive samplers for the same cost as 23 samples uh, uh, or more, if you're doing duplicates on this too, I mean, it could be 20, 20, almost 30 samples. That's a big difference in cost there. So it's definitely an economic incentive as well. So if we look at a 52 day period, you can see that there are a lot of days where there is no results. It's, it's essentially non-detect, right? And then you have these episodic events that are random. How would you know when to sample at a site like this? And how do you even know if your next sampling event or site is like this or like this or something different? It's hard to know. It's unpredictable. You can't know. And so then it comes back to, are you going to collect a lot of samples to evaluate this variability? Or are you going to hire uh, somebody to install a GC and collect everyday sampling to find out uh, when, what the peak period is and what that average time weighted average concentration is going to be. Um, and unfortunately, that's not even uh, a verified laboratory method. And it's very expensive. Or you can just collect two or three samples like here and get an, a time weighted average concentration over the assessed uh, uh, exposure period and get an average concentration that is pretty much the same as what you would have gotten. And again, an RPD of 14% in a controlled environment, that's better and, and 
or, and this is 4% over 23 days. This is 14% over 52 days. That's better than the 30% relative percent difference that you might expect in any sampling methodology. And when you consider that 50% of samples with SUMA canisters may be 100 or more percent different uh, on duplicates, uh, I would be worried about using anything else. So when we look at um, the, pre the precision of the beacon passive samplers, um, we'll look at, we look at the data. Let's look at the triplicate samples and the results. And so this is showing how many events that were done, 13 events, and the number of sampling days. So it's 26 days here, 20 days, 52 days, and I showed you a couple of those as low as seven or six days and up to, you know, uh, and everything in between. And so when we look at the standard deviation and the coefficient of variation uh, from that, we see that the average difference is 0.1. This is very good quality data, very good consistency, high precision, repeatability. This is why EPA uh, decided that passive samplers were the ideal samplers to be used to monitor benzene emissions leaving refineries across the entire US and made it a federal requirement. It's required across the country. Um, passive samplers are very robust and capable of high quality data. So what are the outcomes of the study? That there's a high potential of false negative result uh, concerning vapor intrusion occurrence when using an active soil gas sample or a 24 hour period. Um, there is a high potential to incorrectly characterize the risk, the exposure risk. Um, if you're only collecting 24 hour samples. And there's only about a 50% chance that the sample results would have a mean concentration inside a 10 times range about the true mean concentration. And again, this is published work that's out there for people to review. So passive samplers allow for a collection of samples over days or weeks to measure the organic compounds and vapor phase. Um, in both indoor air, ambient air, and soil gas and sub slab. They're reported in concentrations over time and are more representative of both short and long-term health risks. They're easy to use. They provide uh, concentrations in micrograms per cubic meter. Um, the, you can sample over hours, days, or weeks. And, and uh, if you have a site that has very high concentrations, you know the concentrations are high, and the soil gas because you're investigating a source area, you don't need to sample for days. You can sample for hours. You can sample, you know, for 10, 12 or 24 hours and you will get a concentration if you know the concentrations are high. Uh, generally speaking, we probably like to see a couple days if even if the concentrations are expected to be high. Um, but if you're looking for uh, a, a time weighted average concentration, um, that uh, is not influenced by barometric pumping and other, and other variables, then a longer duration sampling period of many days to weeks would be preferable. There's no pumps, flow re regulators required, so the equipment, there's no equipment hassles or, or delays in, in, in field implementation. There's a 30 day hold time on the samples, so you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, uh, preservation and, and those issues. And so it makes shipping and transport much easier to manage than compared to canisters. And the concentration, the target concentrations can span orders of magnitude. We could be looking at screening level concentrations of one compound and the same sampler, as well as orders of magnitude higher concentrations in a different compound. And that's because of the methodology that we use for evaluating uh, thermal desorption and for um, and, and, and the analytical process in the lab. It's just a more robust method compared to um, sum casters. This is showing the uptake rate linearity uh, over a 14 day period for the beacon passive samplers. And, and based on the uptake rate study that, that was performed, we were able to uh, uh, validate uptake rates for various compounds um, uh, and use that to calculate concentrations um, for samplers deployed on site. And now I'm showing, you know, starting at three days. Again, we could sample for less time. 
it is possible. Generally speaking, if you have really high concentrations, um, the limit of detection is not a concern anymore. And again, at three days, if you're expecting, you know, 100 or 1,000 micrograms per cubic meter um, in a source area, you don't need to sample for three days. You could sample for much less, right? Um, but if you're looking for screening level concentrations really low because you're doing a vapor intrusion study, then maybe a longer duration sample would be more advantageous and more representative of the long-term exposure uh, risk for the inhabitants of the building uh, for which you're assessing the, the soil gas for. Um, and so this is showing uh, a broader a broader uh, race a range and down to one day so you can see what the difference is and so basically a longer sampling periods allow for lower limits of detection uh, reduced influence of temporal variability and approved an improved assessment of steady state soil gas VOC concentrations so let's talk about spatial variability um, why high resolution um, it, the answer is, is to overcome the challenges of spatial variability in the subsurface contamination and to collect a high resolution data set. That is key. You need to maximize the number of locations that can be sampled. Um, and that's easily to do with a soil gas, a passive soil gas survey, because it's, there's less equipment. It's easier to implement. Um, you reduce uncertainty and surprises because it's, it's repeatable and the methodology uh, reduces the likelihood of, of contaminants and, and other issues like leakage from too high of a vacuum or carryover VOCs from uh, uh, an unprecisely cleaned uh, canister. And it allows you to make more well-informed and appropriate corrective action, uh, corrective action decisions. So this is an example of what a low resolution sampling grid of 90 feet compared to a 30 foot sampling grid looks like. And you can see there's a lot more detail and a lot higher resolution data provides more uh, accuracy in terms of where the hotspots are. Had you just done a 90 foot sampling, uh, roughly 30 meters, um, you, would, you would have missed the hotspot and you would have uh, implemented a, a drilling program that would have eventually led you to the appropriate hotspots, uh, but now time was wasted. Um, when you can add a lot, you can add more samples and get more high resolution data uh, up front as a screening, as part of the screening approach and zero in and target your uh, area for high resolution drilling um, with uh, uh, MIHPT or, or something similar. So here's some examples. Here's a gas station with just 20 samples uh, and no prior information other than that the topographic slope was was to the left here in this in this picture. And with the 20 sample sampling event, we were able to determine what the BTEX uh, impact looked like in the source and the release area. This was a, a UST spill. Um, and what looks like a diffuse plume of BTEX moving away from the site down gradient. The presumed groundwater flow direction was to the left at the time, and they uh, did um, ground truthing or verification with drilling and wells to, to verify that all of these assumptions that we gained from this single passive soil gas sampling event came true. So TPH plume is shown here. Um, and then we found that there was an aphthalene, a waste oil uh, source area, which is where they had their waste oil tank uh, in the subsurface, and that was leaking as well. So uh, we were able to identify two plumes, one that was known and one that was unknown, with one 20 sampler passive soil gas survey. Here's a, here's a project actually in Brazil, where they were look, we were looking at uh, monodyne trichlorobenzenes. And uh, this is just a 24 hour exposure period. So like I said, if you know the concentrations are high in the source area and you're looking for a quick assessment as to where the impacts are, you can do a 24 hour sampling event with a passive soil gas that's deploying one day and collecting the next day. 
um, across the site and you will identify quickly where the source areas are and you're getting a steady state sole gas sample that you know is not going to be biased. Now here's an example of a project that was completed and presented uh, just, or just this year. And um, what, what it is is a dry cleaner and the dry cleaner is show, shown here on the left. And they knew that there was an impacts here, but they wanted to assess down gradient. And they found that there was uh, a plume moving um, off site. So they collected, they placed passive soil gas samplers across this area down gradient and along the road uh, or public right of way um, to assess how far this plume might be going. And, and they didn't quite find the end of it, but they were able to document in large part what the plume was looking like and what the direction of groundwater transport preferential transport was just based on the soil gas survey before installing a bunch of wells so this saved the client and the project uh, a fair amount of time and money so here's a conceptual model of what they had discovered and learned from this from this investigation and they found that there was actually a broken sewer line in the subsurface that was leaking and uh, interacting with shallow groundwater table and the groundwater table submerged the sewer line during high period high groundwater uh, level periods and was and was just below or just at the bottom of the collapsed sewer line um, during the low groundwater periods and so seasonal fluctuations was flushing um, the impact zone or the source area which is the sewer line and and re, and feeding this plume that was moving down gradient so a really great study a really great application of soil gas across an area that was low profile didn't cause a, a lot of disruption or attention because passive soil gas samplers are pretty easy to implement and install compared to drill rigs um, imagine a drill rig or some you know large equipment to install traditional vapor probes everywhere that'd be pretty invasive compared to a soil gas with a with a hand with a hand drill so this is another example uh, where uh, they knew there was an impact to drinking water wells um, and this is the drinking water well area and they knew there were dry cleaners um, kind of up gradient they weren't exactly sure where it was coming from so they installed soil gas samplers along the right of way um, and around uh, where this suspected uh, potential sources were. And they found that indeed the two, the two of the dry cleaners that they uh, were concerned about were indeed sources to impacts the groundwater. And so they installed a number of groundwater wells afterwards and verified that the results that they found with the soil gas survey as a screening tool uh, correlated very well with what was being seen in the groundwater table. And again, so we're talking about groundwater concentrations uh, at partitioning from dissolved phase to vapor phase, right? And that's moving into the Vado zone and moving up towards the surface where the passive soil gas samplers are deployed. And in some cases, uh, the groundwater tables, you know, uh, a few meters deep, and in other cases, it's 10 or more meters deep. And it's consistent because we're getting a steady state soil gas concentration that is in equilibrium over periods of days that is not influenced as much by advective flux because the advective flux that's either induced barometrically or by water table fluctuation is changing daily over many days. So you're getting a true average concentration over that time compared to a single point in sample where you don't really know what the conditions are and how, how barometric pressure is influencing it um, or water table. And then you're applying a vacuum. So very different. So what are the key benefits of passive soil gas sampling? Um, accuracy and precision are probably top it's the it's one of the key factors um, it's been revealed in multiple project studies and it shows that there's low variability in duplicates very consistent results and there's low influence in, from moisture on duplicate results because 
the adsorbents that Beacon uses in our pest samplers is hydrophobic. And it's getting it's collecting VOCs over a longer duration time, which mitigates um, the temporal variability that we're seeing due to advective or diffusive flux. The relevant average concentration for risk assessment is also improved. And, and that's because a longer duration sample mitigates temporal variability. So daily and longer periods are by far, by far better. Um, longer duration sampling results in a better approximation of exposure risk. And passive sampling gives you a true mean concentration. The consistency and replicability of passive sampling is also key because if you're sampling a really large site and you have different field crews or different people sampling in different areas, you want to make sure it's consistent and the, the probes are installed consistently. And in an active soil gas survey, that's hard to do unless you have you know, standard operating procedures and assume that everybody's doing it right. But if you're using different sampling probes, like we showed in the one sample, vapor pins in one area, standard probes in a different area, you will get different results. It will be different and uh, consistently different. So how do you correlate that? And this is where having a simple to use, consistent steady state sampler as a passive sampler is going to provide more data quality confidence um, and higher reliability um, in your in your in your results in your interpretation of of the vapor intrusion risk, the concentrations, and an improved conceptual site model. And the fact that data quality confidence is higher because there's no chance of VOC carryover cross contamination based on our uh, quality control measures um, that that's very reassuring. So Beacon is proud to have been supporting uh, Brazilian studies and projects for well over a decade, and we look forward to working with you more. Uh, I'll be answering questions now for anybody who has any questions. And thank you again for your time and attending the webinar. So you can use you can use either the chat window or you can use the question and answer uh, tool on Zoom in order to um, ask any questions that you might have. Well, there aren't any questions. So if there's there, if you have any questions uh, at a later time, uh, feel free to reach out to uh, myself or, or Harry O'Neill, and we'd be happy to work with you on your project. Oh, here, I got a question here. Can PAHs be targeted with passive soil gas samplers? The answer is yes. Um, there are a few PAH uh, contaminants that can be assessed at a screening level with passive uh, the beacon passive samplers and have been used at a numerous sites um, that I can recall in Brazil, across Latin America, in Australia, and in the US, um, and has been very effective um, both in uh, uncovered ground like uh, sandy or dirt, dirt fields, as well as um, uh, areas where it had cement and or asphalt cover. Okay, another question. Uh, can you tell me more about monitoring ambient air with passive samplers during remediation projects to monitor for VOCs moving past property boundary? Yes, so uh, per, in the US, it is very common to do perimeter monitoring during excavation um, uh, 
at sites. So if there's an excavation at a site uh, of shallow or even deeper soils and um, and it's volatile and there are volatile compounds, the uh, the agencies, at least in California, and, and I don't, it's different in different states across the U.S., but in, in California in particular, which I'm most familiar with, um, there's an air quality management district, which is an agency that monitors air quality. They require that uh, the consultants perform 24-hour monitoring during any excavation and uh, covering the piles if, and if in, the, in the pit. If it's not covered and there's VOCs, um, then 24-hour monitoring is required. And that can be very expensive with instruments and equipment. And if you're using SUMA canisters or active, active gas sampling, um, that requires daily sampling and what have you. However, there is a change in recent years that passive samplers, because they can be deployed for many days, um, can be used uh, daily or uh, for an entire week or if it's multiple week project, you can use the same samplers. And, in, and it, it depends on who the agency is or the manager, but you may be able to deploy them 24 hours and then have a second set of samplers that are that are deployed uh, um, the same sampler opened in the morning during uh, when operations start and then at the end of the day you you close the sampler and so that you're collecting uh, an average concentration over the time of active operations and you can do a second set of samplers that's looking just at evening time so you can get you can get average concentrations um, over the time period of exposure in different ways depending on how you use the samplers. That's a really good question because there's a lot of flexibility in what you can do with passive samplers. And it just depends on the objectives of um, the project, the timing of the project, and, uh, and the regulatory case manager. Uh, another question is, how many days are required for samplers to arrive in Brazil? That's a good question. Typically, we're seeing 24 to 48 hours arrival uh, from the time of an approved uh, proposal or scope of work. And that is uh, that usually takes a day or two. So it depends on how organized the uh, field sampling plan and your request for estimate is. Um, so if it's really detailed, typically same day you get an estimate. And if you approve it within the day, then it can potentially, depending on the timing of, of communications, it could be same day or next day shipping, and then it's typically 24 to 48 hours arrival. And so pretty quick. If you, if you know you're going to sample in the next week, uh, if you start a week before, you're going to have your samplers and ready to go in plenty of time. All right. Well, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, you have a great day or a great afternoon and um, feel free to reach out anytime. We'll be looking forward to hearing from you and working with you soon. Take care.